the pastor's heart and Dominic Steele in a heart issue and a skill deficit addressing deep-seated problems in maturity and mission with Andrew Hurd. A few weeks ago on The Pastor's Heart, we talked with Zach Ferrin and Raj Gupta about issues confronting Sydney Anglicans and the problems are big. We looked at this graph showing a massive drop in the number of newcomers since the National Church Life Survey in 2011 from 9.3 down to 7.6 in 2016 and down again to 5.4 in 2021. A more than 10 year trend of fewer people joining church, either through evangelistic growth or returners to church. And alongside that, as one might expect, there's been a drop in attendance. In the years between 2015 and 2019, there was a 7.5% drop in attendance and it's worsened through COVID. But it's not just Sydney Anglicans that need a wake up call here. It's actually most of us in Australian evangelicalism. And if you're a senior pastor watching from around the world, it's highly likely that there'll be a massive overlap between your problems and our problems. So this discussion will be helpful for you too. Andrew Hurd leads the large and influential EV church on the central coast of New South Wales. He's also the key person behind the influential Reach Australia movement and a player in the fellowship of independent evangelical churches. Andrew says we've got problems with head, heart and hand. Uh, we're going to come to those solution areas. But first, the problem, Andrew, thanks for coming down. And this cold, hard look at the facts is confronting to our pastor's hearts. We're not good at it. We want to focus on the positive, mm. but we need to look at the cold, hard things. Absolutely. Yeah. If we're going to see change, we need to face the facts of where we are. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems is there's not enough of that. Mm -hmm. we're, um, I think we're determined to kind of just keep doing what we've been doing without reference to whether it's making a difference or not. Mm. And so we've, we've, we've got to pay attention to that. Um, in fact, it's a bigger question, isn't it? Uh, as, we, as we're doing our ministries, are we in it to make a difference, uh, to create what mm. I would call an outcome, mm -hmm. or, or are we just there to turn the wheels of our ministries? Mm. Are we there just to keep church going and doing so? What's the difference we want to make? And I take it given Matthew 28, the difference is we want to make disciples. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are called to win people to faith, win people to Christ, become a disciple and deepen in their walk with Christ. That's, that's the marching orders of the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. where he ascended. And so that's the difference we need to make. And that compels us to have to ask questions about, are we making that difference? Mm -hmm. What is happening? Uh, and if it's not happening, we need to ask even deeper questions. Why? What's mm. going on? Yeah. So this denominational data and, and across the wider movement of evangelicalism, most of us think about this data for our own church rather than the bigger picture. And actually, we don't think about the data for our own church that much. Yeah, often not. That's right. I think it's... Um, I think there's, there's a whole bunch of things that are happening for us as reformed evangelicals particularly. Mm -hmm. I think there's, you know, some of the head things you mentioned, mm -hmm. Ed. I think there's some, I think we tend towards a kind of hyper-Calvinism mm -hmm. where we imagine, um, uh, you know, God gives the growth. My task is to just turn up and mm -hmm. do what I do. Mm -hmm. and, and almost do what's in front of me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just do the seven-day cycle, you know, the urgent, the necessary, the, the, the people who call on me, I do. Um, and we do need to step back from that and say, no, no, I'm here to make a difference. Do I agree that Matthew 28 is the difference I need to make? Well, how am I going against that? I mm. need to look and I need to see. Mm. Well, let's just talk newcomers for a minute. And um, I just want us to look at the Sydney Anglican graph on newcomers. And um, this was expecting a fall from 9%, but it's actually come in 1% lower at 5.4%. Um, what's your sense? Why are we going down in newcomers? Uh, there will be a raft of reasons, and they'll, some of those reasons will be different in different places. And so this is part of the challenge. There's, um, there's lots of similarities across churches in a cultural context, mm -hmm. say Sydney Diocese. Mm -hmm. There are lots of similarities. You, you, the churches of Sydney Diocese are part of a big ecosystem mm. of mm. Uh, independent congregationally, yes, the, the theology of independence in a sense, but you're part of a, a training culture, a more college-centred, mm. a synodical government, a licensing and something. There's a whole bunch of things that mean that there's a cultural shape to Sydney Diocese mm. that's centred around all of that. And so there'll be lots of features that are happening in each church that are similar. 
And I, I, I do see many of those similar things across reformed evangelicalism around the world. Mm -hmm. It is interesting to see a lot of the same things. And I think it comes back to um, a number of theological convictions that we carry, mm -hmm. um, uh, issues about our heart, our, our passions, what, what drives us, um, but also the skill side of things. Mm -hmm. I think we have a shape in the way we think about doing our ministries that is common very mm -hmm. largely around the place. And all of these things are adding together to create a, a perfect storm in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, before we get to those solutions, I just want to, you're saying the newcomer drop is more widespread totally. than just our yeah. patch here in Sydney. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, absolutely. And are you seeing that kind of halving across the board? Well, COVID is a massive piece in all of this. Yeah, but bef I mean, before you get to COVID, in Sydney Anglicanism, we went from nine point four to six to yeah. something. We went from well, twelve point four in two thousand and one to uh, seven in two thousand and sixteen. That's a half. <laughs> Do you know? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I mean. Yeah. Well, well, the, the question to ask, well, one of the questions to ask is, uh, how common is that across congregations? Is, yeah. it, is it incredibly patchy church-wise? Mm -hmm. If it's common, if it's a large shape movement across all the, service, the churches of Sydney Diocese, then you've got a system issue. Are there things that are common to the way we're thinking about ministry, um, the heart we're bringing to it, mm -hmm. and the skills we're exercising? So there's a whole raft of things there that need to be considered. Mm -hmm. Now, you've given us a couple of stats, uh, and we'll put that graph up on mission stats, Sydney Anglican versus the other Reformed Evangelical. And look, can I just say, if you're listening to the Pastor's Heart podcast this week, it would be helpful to watch it because the graphs are going to be crucial to what we're going yeah, to be saying here. Yeah, yeah. Now, the blue is Sydney Anglicans. The orange is other Reformed Evangelical. Do you want to explain that? Yeah, it... Um uh, I've tried to kind of provide a, a few churches that are from our tribe, mm -hmm. you know, trained through college, the mm -hmm. same college, the same cultural context, um, and use them as a comparison instead of the average of Sydney diocese. Mm -hmm. um, because the average of Sydney diocese is, is not very confronting, it's not very mm -hmm. challenging. Um, but these other churches provide that. And I've tried to keep EV out of it. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, okay, right. I, I yeah. don't want to make it an EV thing. Um, but it actually does help to, to see what's happening in... There are some churches that are performing very differently in the same culture. Right. In the same soil. There was a very, before coming to this, just a quick anecdote. There was a, we, one of the church plants that came through our Reach Australia work mm -hmm. um, was established in a city context. Uh, and the first few years, they were seeing converts regularly mm -hmm. each year. And the, uh, the local reformed evangelical church that had been there for some decades, generations, um, bless them, the, the senior minister there, uh, the young church planter told me this. The senior minister arrived in his building one day mm -hmm. with his elders in tow. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he sat his elders down in this new building or this uh, renovated space and said, uh, this church is seeing X number of converts a year. About 5% of their adult attendants were being converted a year. And uh, he, said, he said this wonderfully. He said, uh, we're on the same street. Uh, we, we are, we've got the same gospel. Mm. They're not preaching anything different to us. Uh, it's not the soil. Mm. There's something that we're doing or not doing that they are. It's, it's something we're bringing to the exercise. Mm. Now, identifying that, that, that is a, bless the man, that is a mm. massively great exercise mm. in leadership. It's, it's kind of confronting the brutal facts mm -hmm. and, and cutting away all the potential excuses mm. and saying, what are we bringing to the task? Mm. Yeah. And so these, this bit of data helps in Let, some Let's measure. look at it. So, I mean, the involved in outreach on the other reformed evangelical is so much higher. I'm looking at that left column. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got, um, there's Sydney Diocese's average. But the other Reformed Evangelical churches, and as I say, from our tribe, are seeing a far greater involvement within their congregational life, uh, mm. as they self-report, yeah. um, that they're involved in mission, uh, in speaking with their friends and inviting their friends and so on and so forth. You see a slightly improved sense of at ease with sharing their faith, um, but it's that left-hand one that's just a particularly striking one to say, um, we have some of our churches from our cultural context in our tribe that are actually doing 
far better than the average in the Sydney Diocese. Mm -hmm. It's possible to do far more than we're doing. But the other uh, stats there just give an interesting uh, kind of flavour that's more fuller than that. So sense of belonging, what's interesting to these churches that I've chosen to be the other reform ones, um, in our tribe and so on, they're bigger churches. Mm -hmm. um, and typically we have a critique of the large church that it's a crowd of people who are disconnected, mm -hmm. just consumers and so on. But these churches are seeing a greater sense of belonging. And that corresponds very largely to people wanting their friends to come and be hearing the gospel. Right. So there's a number of features. The more I feel like I belong. The more oh, there's a number of features that work in church life that actually cultivate a sense of people in church wanting to be on mission mm -hmm. and engaging in mission and not just thinking they ought to be. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of ought-driven people, which is good. But when you turn that into, I want my friends mm. to experience this and know this and they're captivated, part of that is, is shaped by the sense of belonging in church. This mm -hmm. church is somewhere that uh, is, is a wonderful experience that's making a difference in my life. Mm -hmm. I want my friends to have this experience. Uh, it, you see it correspond and correlate with growth in conversions. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, what about vision there? The, the, the other reformed people are much, much stronger on vision. I, I mean, if I push back on you, I feel like most of the other reformed people that I look around, they've got founding pastors still in place and they've got more stable staff teams than I see in the Anglican denominational churches. Uh, and I wonder um, whether or not the... Uh, moving around of staff contributes to that, or are there other factors? Yeah. Well, see, see, right there yeah, is very helpful. Yeah. What, what, no, but, but what you've just observed is, is it something we're doing? Yeah, okay, yeah. So, so that right there is a profoundly important insight mm -hmm. that it's not the soil. Right, yes. That, that, that it's, it's not simply this is the way it has to be in Sydney. Mm -hmm. Because what we have is churches that are being led in a certain way for, because of a very series of features, let's mm -hmm. say, um, that are getting far better buy-in to the vision of what they're about mm -hmm. uh, and seeing people more confident in it actually making a difference. And so they're prepared to give much more to the task. Mm -hmm. um, what are those features and how much can we replicate them back into established churches in Sydney? It's just, mm. but, but buying into that ground conviction is critical, mm -hmm. that there are things we're bringing and we're doing that make a difference, fundamental. Too much of, part of why I do the head, heart, hand, part of our head issue is a kind of hyper-Calvinism mm -hmm. that says the Lord gives the growth where he wills, 1 Corinthians 3, and so it's, it, I don't need to look at me, mm. you know, I don't need to look at the data. Mm. Uh, I just do what I do faithfully and whatever happens, happens. But what I'm trying to offer here is that same people, same gospel, same church culture, seeing far better outcomes. Mm. There's a difference that's made by what we bring mm. to the task. Yeah. And I mean, I am feeling uh, frustrated that across the board, we're not getting the outcomes that we should. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. we said we wanted to get there. We've been doing stuff and we've not got there. And we're not having a hard conversation about why we're not there. Well, I, I would offer in part, it, it's likely impossible, and this is the investigation that needs to be done, it's likely impossible the heart's not in it really. Because the this is the head heart. Mm. Um, the, the far more important stat than the newcomer stat, you know, the dropping mm -hmm. newcomers, the far more important stat is that in, in the Sydney region, was it almost 5 million people, mm. um, you add up church attendance of all Protestant denominations in Sydney, best guess, it's about 200,000. Yep. Sydney's about 50 to 60,000, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, what percentage of that is, five, you know, that's, mm. is it 3% or something? Minuscule, yeah. It's, it's minuscule. And until, until our churches feel the weight of that, they won't care about the problem of the newcomer issue. Mm -hmm. until, we, until we are genuinely captivated, captured by the sense that our city's going to hell. Mm. You know, 97% of people are lost without hope, without God. Mm. Until, until that grips our hearts, we won't look at the data, pay attention to what needs to happen to change it, own the fact that we bring things to this, until we're captive. So it's a heart issue, as much as it's a head issue, as much as it's a skill issue. But foundationally, it's a heart issue. Because if we're going to make the changes we need to make, a um, little principle we run with in the Reach Australia world is, um, you won't make change, which you need to make, mm. until the pain of not changing 
is greater than the pain of change. And, and you can't create the pain of not changing without taking a hard look at the fact of heaven and hell. Mm. Okay. So heaven, yeah. I mean, I was thinking the pain of not changing should be clear with a 7.5% attendance drop, but you're saying, yeah. Well, well no, 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 because it, it, um, if a church genuinely thinks that the difference I'm here to make is to be a faithful presence, mm -hmm. where the church is going up or down is irrelevant to me. Do, 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 mm. It goes back to that fundamental question, what, what is the difference we are here to make? Is our purpose to make disciples or is it to be a faithful presence? Is it, mm. Clarifying that, again, is a head thing there. Theologically, biblically, um, I, I, do, I do think that... So do you think we as senior leadership have failed in this area, have failed in our understanding and failed in our communication? I, look, I, you know, the danger is bad cop, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I want to say, Sid, I think Sid, the Sydney Diocese is a wonderful is a wonderful testament to the grace of God over many generations. So mm -hmm. I, um, whenever anyone attacks any diocese, I'm right there wanting to defend it. It's all that we do, all that I do, is the fruit of the work mm. over generations. So mm -hmm. I just, I want to lay that out. But um, we do need to have a hard look at ourselves, whether the way we're thinking about ministry, the way we're thinking about um, God's purposes for us, uh, hasn't sufficiently been gripped by things we need to be gripped by. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, what is the vision that we have? For, you know, when, when we go into a church ministry as a senior leader, what am I there to do? Am I, what difference have I, what, what's the difference I'm meant to make? What's the outcome mm -hmm. I'm meant to achieve? Um, well, if you go in there quietly and perhaps unconsciously imagining the difference is just to be a faithful witness, then you'll, you, you won't like the church is declining. Mm -hmm. But as long as you continue to be a faithful witness, you'll feel like you're succeeding. You're achieving your goal. Mm -hmm. And I want to push in and say, is that all God calls us to be? Mm -hmm. A faithful witness? Or does he call us to achieve an outcome? Mm -hmm. Make disciples. Yeah. Win people and deepen them. Mm -hmm. Two things. Yeah. And so there is, a, there is a question to ask about our own heart, our own convictions. Let's just do the maturity issues and we'll put that stat up for a moment. Um, and uh, you've given us statistics here with the blue one here. Well, actually, we'll go to the next one. The blue one here is the uh, Sydney Anglican uh, column. And then you've called it other uh, Protestant is the orange. And then the other Reformed Evangelical. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you, you've introduced here the um, wider Protestantism in the middle column, which yeah. is, I take it, including liberal Christianity yeah, pro yeah. Pro and Hillsong and e everyone. Pentecostals, yeah. all those. All non-Catholic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us the breakdown. Yeah. I think what happens for our world of Christian leadership is that we can retreat into the sense that we're, we can't win the country. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is commit ourselves to maturing the saints. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, um, I might not be the mission evangelist, but I can be the, the pastor who disciples and grows. Mm -hmm. and so this is to draw attention to the fact, if that's the difference you're intending to make in your church, if you've come to actually commit yourself to make disciples in maturing them, we're not doing a great job. So when you compare Sydney Diocese to all Protestant, uh, We've got a slightly better run I mean, you'd on... You'd hope you'd be doing better than the Liberals and hope you'd be doing... You know. Well, here, here's, we're the Bible guys. Yeah. We're the Bible guys. And look at preaching. Preaching is helpful. This is self-reporting. So people in our congregations are saying our preaching is less helpful than those that are in other Protestant churches. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other column there, the higher column, is people from our tribe uh, who are... Uh, doing ministries in such a way that people are self-reporting, my life is changing through this mm -hmm. ministry. I'm, yeah. I'm being transformed by the growth in understanding God in church. Um, we, Sydney Anglicans is on par with all Protestants. We're the Bible guys. The, mm. We're the ones... We should be above that. Yeah. You, 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 the, the, the expectation is that we're trained to be the Bible people, the discipleship people. Maybe we're not the great mission people, but the but we're not, we're not making much difference there. Mm. Um, and I dare say one of the dangers, which is the head-heart thing, is that we're, we're operating with a sense that um, I'm here to be a faithful presence and my aim, my success, the difference I want to make is that this group of people make it to the end. 
And my concern there is, I think that's hidden in the hearts of many of us. Mm -hmm. My aim is just to get this group of people to the end. That's a wonderful aim, but it's a very low bar. Mm. It's not the bar the Lord Jesus calls us to do. Mm. He calls us to transform and change and radicalise a generation. Mm. We're not seeing that happen. Yeah. Our services, you go back to that chart and you'll see that our services are um, inspired during services always. Um, our services, are, people are self-reporting that they're not doing, church is not doing much for them. Mm. Now, now our question, of course, and that could, now we do have many in our world that are performing much better there. The, the thing that happens in response to me pointing that out to others is this. Well, should our services inspire? You see, so mm -hmm. they, they're asking the right question, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. what difference should our services make in the life of a person who comes? Yep. Should a person come and go, this has really captured me, captivated mm -hmm. me, or should they go, um, I've heard again the faithful truths and I'll press on again for another week? Um, what difference should our services make, our, our church gatherings make in the life of a person? Mm -hmm. um, now, you can go the low bar, uh, but I want to contend for the fact that uh, the Lord Jesus calls us to much more. And there is a very strong correlation between people who are coming to our services and, and going, uh, this is mind blowing. This is, mm. this is life transforming. I need my friends to come and hear this gospel mm. that's changed my life. Um, now, I'm not suggesting, of course, that every church needs to become an incredible performance. Not mm. at all. Mm. Um, I mean, but we do need to face that fact that, it's, that, that our congregations are self-reporting. This is not going well. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I'm just saying, I would hope that somebody is edified that they're corrected, rebuked, taught and trained. Do you know? Yeah. Well, if that is happening, you would expect yeah. them to report growth. Some of those things happening. That, yeah. that when they're asked, are you seeing much growth through this church? You would expect a high percentage of people are saying that. Mm. But we're not. And you actually drew a distinction between much growth through this church and much growth in their Christian life in general. Yeah. You know? yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's actually important. I mean, if we as pastors are doing that job, we actually want, I mean, it's nice if they're growing by reading Christian books, but we want them to grow through our church. Do you know? Yeah, exactly right. A and imagine a world where not only are they getting great resources in other contexts, yeah. but also when they come to church, that's adding more, mm. adding great fire and fuel to the whole work. Now, you've been nibbling at this as we've gone through, but um, I want to now drill down in more detail of, okay, we've got some problems, what do we do? And you talked about um, heart, head and hands, because um, you're saying it's not simple, it's not that... The issue is not just that we can run a different evangelistic course, go that's for right. a new brand of that, that or yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Um, yeah. we all start door knocking or whatever. Yeah, the, yeah, it's yeah. a much more systemic problem than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not, so there's no silver bullet. That's yeah. right. Let's, do, let's drill properly down in heart then. And you alluded to hyper-Calvinism before. Let's go back and kick around that. Well, I would put the, that's in terms of, I'd put that in my head category. Yeah, just okay, because, right, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, for the me, heart is the lost concern. It is the passion, yeah, do, do you yeah. see? Um, and there is a reality, unless I I'm, unless I'm, um, have the energy to see change happen, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. Um, but so of, one of the, some of us, we could all just all feel exhausted because of COVID, and so I don't have the, the heart. The I think we're over that. Are you over? I okay. think we need yeah. to move on. Right. I think okay. we need to stop telling ourselves how tired we are from COVID. Okay, you know? right. Uh, there might be a few in that place that appropriately need some supports, but the rest of us need just to step up and step get up again. Um, put your big boy yeah, pencil. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> the, um, uh, the hyper Calvinism, I, I do think the 1 Corinthians 3, so you, you, God gives the growth. Mm -hmm. you, you know, what is Apollos? What, what am I? We're nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, God's the one who gives the growth. The, one of the dangers with our, uh, our focus on the sovereign, what well, God is sovereign. Mm -hmm. uh, all that happens is by his sovereign will. Praise God for that. I can rest in that. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful truth. It's a, it's a biblical truth, a fundamental truth. He's the one who, Ephesians 1, he does it all. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting in 1 Corinthians 3, just as one place to look, um, the Apostle Paul then goes on to talk about himself as building as a master builder. 
mm -hmm. uh, as a wise master builder. So it's a little set of Greek words there, sophos, architectone. And, it's, and, and the Apostle Paul is saying he paid attention to the way he did all that he did. Uh, and you ought to pay attention to that as well. So no one should build with another foundation, you know, the, the gospel, mm. the crucified Christ, the resurrected Jesus and so on. Um, but nonetheless, when you follow and look at all that Paul did in his ministries, he paid great attention to the way he did what he did. Uh, he didn't just retreat into some kind of God is sovereign, it doesn't matter what I do. Mm -hmm. I can just turn up and preach the sermon I always preached. I can just reheat that. I can. He actually paid attention to what will be most effective, flavoured by the gospel with the boundaries of the gospel, all the rest, yes. But uh, there was a wisdom, a wise a wisdom that he brought to the task. And we need to actually embrace that. So there's the hand piece, you see, the head. Once I break free from hyper-Calvinism, and I'm aware actually that I make a difference. Mm -hmm. The way I do my ministries makes a difference. Once I, once I come down that journey, I'll now pay attention to what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And let's just talk about, firstly, before we get to the, the what I might actually do, just take me through the various conversations you've had with ministers, because you've gone into lots of coaching conversations yeah, with ministers yeah. who have chosen to make themselves vulnerable at this point, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and how have you helped? How have you helped, and how have you seen people embrace that I actually need to th to do something different here? Do you know my my approach is wrong? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's a number of things. I, you want to sit with a pastor mm -hmm. and just love them to start with, mm -hmm. because many of us pastoral ministry is hard work. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at me. You know, look yeah. at us. You know, um, it, it is hard work. So we want to get alongside pastors and say, look, you know. We, empathy, understanding, compassion, yep. um, but we can do better. Um, and so partly what I'm wanting to do, and, and this is the Reach Australia work, so this is not just me, but one of the things we're trying to do in this kind of crowd of people in Reach Australia who are wanting to get together and see if we can make a difference, get this whole work, this whole Reach Australia moving forward. Um, we want to come alongside and, and, and start to do some investigative work about our own hearts. Um, uh, to be prayerful about the gospel, to preach the gospel to myself, to, to preach the realities of heaven and hell to myself, uh, to see God's vision in, in the purpose of Christ being be all in all, you know, the Ephesians 1 verse 10. Um, we, we want to see how much time is short, eternity is short. There's a whole bunch of things we want to talk into the heart of a person and say, you know, um, step up again, gird your loins, uh, prayerfully do what you need to do to get the energy back and let's together, and that's one of the great powers of Sydney Diocese, we can go together in this task. Um, so there's where we start because unless there's a passion and energy about the lostness of the lost, you won't make the changes you need to make and you won't sustain those changes. You, 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 you won't work hard to actually analyse where I am bringing problematic things and I don't, then won't be disciplined in holding to those things, the changes that need to happen. Very often what happens for, for men is they, and women, they, they go to a conference, they get stirred, they go back to their hard situation, they get caught in the seven day cycle and they, they, they just get buried. How do they get out of that seven day cycle? A conference won't help. <laughs> They need people to walk alongside each of us. What I find with lots of leaders, that, that, that when you ask them, what is the difference you hope to see happen in this place if you're here for five to 10 years? Mm -hmm. you know, what's the outcome you wanna see by virtue of you being here for five to 10 years? What's, what's the, mm. the thing you wanna achieve? It's interesting how that question uh, is not easy for people to answer. So there's a lack of clarity about what I'm here to achieve. What's the difference I'm here to make? Right there is an issue. Mm. You know. Skills. Yeah. You're telling me we're well. We're we're not getting it round right on the ground as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a heart issue. There's a head issue. The, the way we think about our ministries. Uh, but if we're bought into a generalist model, then we've not learned actually how to do various leadership activities well. We're not just running a group of individuals as a church. We're not just leading a bunch of individuals that we disciple. We are now leading, if we've taken on leadership of a church, we're leading an, an organism, a large extended family. 
um, which takes skill to manage. Mm -hmm. There's a very fine article by Don Carson in um, Thamelios on the word overseer. Mm -hmm. And he makes the point that the word overseer itself carries the connotation of management and organisation. And so one of the keys for eldership in his view is that you have skills in being able to manage and organise. That's just not part of our DNA, mm. and that's part of our culture. That's um, the cult, part of the cultural problem. That's yeah. our. That's what I see in Reformed Evangelical all over the place. So, so it's put most crassly in the context where a leader will say, um, "We don't do strategy." Do, do you know, mm. we, yeah. I mean, I, we just I was appalled at, at some of the people at the Synod who said that just oh. a few weeks ago. Oh, sorry, yeah. I, I wasn't. I'm, <laughs> yeah. Forgive me. I, did, I had no idea. Yeah. The, um, but the, the, the thought that Paul had no strategy. Mm. Uh, that, that given the lostness of the lost, that we don't bring everything that we can to bear on mobilising the saints to the task of reaching a city going to hell, that takes strategic thinking. That takes um, the ability to, to think about how can I be clear on the big task I'm seeking to achieve? How can I break it down in a way that I can organise to it? And how can I then manage and lead to resource all of this? Mm. They're, they're, they're yeah, just, strategic thoughts. They're, yeah. yeah, and they're just, they're just bread and butter. Mm. Um, I mean, and we had Raj Gupta and Zach Verin here a couple of weeks ago. And, I mean, Zach said he just thought it would be great as one thing if every church had a plan, Do you know. Now, that's a positive thing for every church to have a plan, but we need to be having bigger picture thinking as well, don't we? Yeah, to totally. I, one of the other things I, I, I find myself reacting to is an either-orism. Yeah. You, you know, and you see it in all kinds of areas, but one of the ways I think in this last month, you know, I've only poked my head a little bit into mm -hmm. the discussions in Sydney Diocese. I love you guys. I want, I want good for you. Um, but what I've seen is a kind of either-orism where... Either the diocese tells us what to do, or we work it out ourselves. Yeah, and and I'd want to push back and say it's both end, mm -hmm. um, and it needs to be both end in the Sydney diocese, particularly because um, Sydney diocese is a highly tightly integrated system of churches, mm -hmm. independent, governed, and so on, mm -hmm. but that tightly integrated such that what happens at the centre in the diocese flavors and shapes what happens in the congregation mm. but more than that there's a positive um, opportunity given mm. your tightly connected world where if, if the diocese actually pays attention to things it can do as a centralized body um, there are some things it can do particularly that congregations can't if it thinks about how to achieve those things whilst at the same time encouraging the congregations to think about their work you've got a you've got to multiply power both end needs mm. to happen yeah yeah I, I would resist, I would be reluctant to have a diocesan central office um, tell the congregations how to do the particulars of their ministry. Mm. I, I think there's a, that would be perhaps overstepping what would be most helpful for the whole movement. Yeah, well, I mean, I, anal I looked at the, um, the previous mission plan. We had the Mission 2020, and there were some really good goals, like increase your newcomers and increase the much growth in faith statistic, those yeah, kind yeah, of things. Yeah. And I thought, well, I want our church to be increasing its newcomers and increasing its much growth in faith statistics. Do you yeah, know? Yeah, I mean, sorry. I'm going to get there to a different out. I'm going to get there in my own way, yeah, but I've yeah, got yeah. to actually be looking at those numbers. To yeah. Now, I have looked at the diocesan thing. Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, uh, wonderful the diocese is in synod agreeing to some of these things. Well, it's, it's one thing to say, to say the newcomer side. Let's set a target to increase newcomers to church. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would offer there's a, there's a deeper and, and um, uh, more fundamental uh, mm -hmm. target to deal with, mm -hmm. which is the lostness of the city. Yeah. So there, there's, there's something that actually needs to sit behind that. But then the question is how? Mm. Uh, okay, let's set a target to see more people convert. Let's set a target to see more newcomers. The real question then becomes, what are we going to do? What, what's this, what, how are we going to achieve that? Mm. What changes need to be made? Because if you just keep doing ministry the way you guys have been doing ministry, you won't get any change. The newcomers will go down and the it'll attendance will go down. It'll continue to decline. Yeah. But that how question is absolutely critical and needs some good, clear thinking, good, good minds at, at work in, in doing a diocesan discussion. Um, I think there's been some wonderful work in the diocese about greenfields and mm. so on. That's something the diocese can do that congregations it's, it's aren't. It's magic, yeah. yeah. There's some really good thinking there. But 
Um, there's some other things the diocese could pay attention to that would help the congregations without imposing on them. But congregations need often an outside voice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think all of us need to have someone stick their head in and say, there's things you're not seeing here. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's ways and practices that you've you've been used to for so long you, know, you, up, you yeah. don't notice anymore mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole partnership thing that needs to happen mm -hmm. which again is reach australia sorry to push mm -hmm. this thing but the whole idea of reach australia is to is to is to get church leaders together to work on this together and see what we can do together mm. uh, yeah you and I were chatting during the week, and it's just a slight digression from where we've gone. Um, but um, one of the ideas of, um, uh, well, it is a digression of where we've gone. But you just you just said to me, and, and I just wanted to f deal with this quickly. Um, the process of performance reviews for senior ministers um, of 360 reviews every three years rang all sorts of alarm bells for you. Yes, yeah, we did have that conversation. Because um, that's being suggested at the moment, right, and right. they're asking for feedback on that. And when, when you said it rang alarm bells for you, I resonated with much of what you said, particularly for the dysfunctional church. Yeah, yeah. Which is quite a number. Yeah. Look, I, again, I just want to preface this by saying I'm, I'm looking in from the outside. You mm -hmm. know, I, I'm a child of the diocese. I've come mm -hmm. through on you know, all the rest. But um, so, so mm -hmm. aware of that. And I know the Royal Commission requires some things about some thoughts. Of, yeah. So there's pieces there that, that need to be borne in mind. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, if I, if, let me just share my thoughts. Do with them as you will. But I think if you require all the churches, 250 churches, to do a 360 review of their senior leader every three years. 20% of the churches will find that helpful. There'll be a bunch of leaders who, you know, that whole process. 40%, mm. uh, mate, pull that numbers out, but 40% mm -hmm. will go, uh, thank you, I don't know what to do with it. Someone might try and tell them what to do with it, but they won't do anything about it. It'll be a waste of time. Mm -hmm. There'll be no consequence from it. But the, the final percentage will be harmful. 40%. There'll be a bunch of people, or 30%, whatever the number is. Uh, but not an insignificant number. But, but I would say not an insignificant, and for a number of reasons. 360 reviews often are an opportunity for disgruntled people to express you know, their mm -hmm. unhappiness. And they're often driven by people who don't understand what the minister's trying to achieve. Now that can be, you know, you might say there's ways to get around that. But to get around that and manage it so it's not harmful takes a lot of resource, thought, consideration from outside to make sure the 360 thing works across the board. Mm. I, I can't see the diocese. I don't know if the diocese has been good at doing that kind of thing. Mm. And so my, my fear would be you'll spend a lot of resource on well, they, something. They, well, they've said the budget is only $500 per thing. And I'm thinking, how can it not? harm yeah. sometimes when you've only got that much resource. Yeah. The, the, the churches that will get harmed will be, will be the ones led by good men and women who are trying to bring change uh, and they'll just have disgruntled people. Because um, when you make change there are some people who are disgruntled. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you, to, to, to get a plateau declining church into growth you, you, you need to disrupt things. You mm -hmm. do need to break things. You need to change things. Um, and that'll leave some, some pain and hurt. Uh, it'll hurt that, the good guys. Um, but there'll be some leaders who are, who are doing the best they can. And you want to stand by them and applaud them and say, if you can just get this group of people to the end, clinging to Christ, hallelujah, mm -hmm. those guys will get judged unfairly and critiqued inappropriately and get damaged in the process as well. There's, uh, you, you just got to, the whole 360 thing um, has a place in some context, but to make it a blanket thing across the diocese, I, th th there's my raw thoughts as someone watching from outside. Yeah, I mean, you and I had this little chat um, uh, where you said much the same thing as that to me during the week. And I tried that argument out on a group of lay people and I didn't manage to persuade them. You know, there, there is a movement in the corporate world against 360s. Do you, do you know, mm -hmm. there, I don't know how widespread it is, but there's a, an awareness that um, over a period of time, there might be an initial trigger that's good and helpful, but over a period of time. It, so, the, you know, the corporate world hasn't got all the answers and doesn't think it's all. But the other thing, 
when you ask if I went to the staff room of a corporation with the CEO sitting there and, I, and said to the staff room with the CEO, do you think we should do a 360 of the CEO? What is every staff member going to say? Of course, he needs to learn from me. Absolutely. I want to, have my, I want to say something to him. Mm. Um, so the question is the more important one. Will that process be most helpful to achieve the outcomes we're after? Which is growth and change in the senior leadership and the way he's doing things. Um, just asking the staff whether they think it will, you'll always get an answer yes. Mm. So you, you, there's built in uh, biases here that need to be borne in mind. And Synod, I think I did mention this to you, that Synod is made up of the rector and two lay reps. Mm. So what you've got in other language, crassly put, the, the boss and two staff. Mm. Um, <laughs> mm. Of course, you, you know, it's just that's the way it'd go. Um, but you need someone from outside to say, "Will this man benefit? This woman benefit from having a 360?" With a lot of care, yes. But who's going to manage that care? That's a huge thing. Mm. Yeah, and I can't see that five hundred dollars is enough to manage that complex care. I, yeah. I don't. <laughs> my view from a distance is that. That's not the key. Yeah. Now, it might be required because the Royal Commission, yeah. there might be something there that just you have to do something. You've got to do something, yeah. But, but if you want to see the diocese Grow. move from decline into growth, the, the 360 is not going to do it. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, that's the note to finish on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My guest on The Pastor's Heart, Andrew Heard, he is the Senior Minister of EV Church on the Central Coast and, uh, well, the founder of Reach Australia. You've been with us on The Pastor's Heart. We'll look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon. Mm -hmm.